I'm Dr. Lizina Schaefer, and I level the playing field of knowledge around wellness, medicine, and research to help you to make informed decisions. Welcome. Welcome to the Dr. Connect where we are connecting through inspiring stories and providing education and information around wellness, health, cancer, and medical technology. I'm your host, Dr. Ludmila Schaefer, broadcasting from Kansas City in the United States. All information discussed on this platform does not substitute your medical care. All guests on this platform sharing own stories, experiences, and conclusions. And today, I would like to invite all of you to join uh, with our special guest. And this is international community and we are sharing experiences from all over the world. And if you would like to learn more about all information, please connect with us as well as we are welcome and uh, would love to hear from you on our YouTube channel. And with that, I would like to introduce our very first and special, special guest. Welcome, 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 Aisha. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, even though for me, it's almost midnight in India. <laughs> yes, thank you for joining us. And uh, I know it's a dif difference in the time and we're so respectful to that, but also, we would love to hear from you. Aisha, would you please tell us your full name, where are you located, and we would love to hear some of your backstory. Okay, my name is Aisha Rao. I live in South India in a uh, metro called Chennai. It was originally known as Madras until they changed the name. Um, I'm essentially, I studied in the UK. I, I, I'm actually a graduate in marine and microbiology, but I returned to India and went into advertising as a writer. Mm. And uh, that was in Calcutta oh, many, many years ago, 1982. Yeah, it's a long time, 1980. So it's a long time ago, nearly 41 years. Uh, and um, I got transferred to Madras at that time. It was known as Madras. And I've been here ever since 1982. Um, I had I got married. I have two kids, and that's when I started this organization called the Little Theater. It's a it's a children's theater company. It's about 30 years old, and uh, we are India's number one not-for-profit children's theater company. We do a lot of work with children, zero to 15, and we train a lot of actors who are, you know, adult actors who have gone on to join the film world and they've all become pretty big names. And uh, more than that, we do a lot of outreach work. So uh, in the beginning, we used to educate children, underprivileged children. Uh, we used to give them creative workshops. And uh, we did that for about 25 years. But in 2015, I started a new program, which was an outreach program connecting arts and healthcare. So we created India's first hospital clown troupe uh, because I realized that actors, professional actors uh, are able to, they already know improvisational skills. And so it was easier for them to uh, pick up the clowning skills and so on. And I flew in a, a trainer from New York uh, Hillary Chaplin, and she came in and trained uh, 12 of my actors and me. I was the 13th person. Uh, just for, I did it just to find out the degree of difficulty and to know what it is for people to go through the whole program of being, you know, uh, trained into a hospital clown. My daughter is a medical doctor, and she's India's first medical clown. So... Yes, right. And this is brings to a very valuable experience because we are speaking today about mindset and health. And even if you are in a theater, I just want to tell the entire audience that how many things connected around us that we think it's not health and it's not wellness, 
but it's actually all you know around. And I would like just to step back for a minute and ask you, so what made you actually to go in the theater? You're so much related between theater and medicine. And uh, can you help us to find some link here? Well, I've always, I grew up all over the world because my father used to work for the United Nations. So he was posted in different countries in Africa. And then I was sent off to boarding school in India. And so I was privileged and lucky to be able to be exposed to different kinds of activities. And so we learned music, we did theater, we did oh, a whole lot of art forms. And I'm essentially a scientist because uh, I did physics, chemistry, biology, maths, and I almost went in to do medicine when I didn't. But I was oh, probably... <laughs> Yes. <laughs> you succeeded through your My daughter is a doctor. <laughs> yes. It all just happened that way. I think I was meant to not go into medicine so that I would return to India and set up this theater company, which actually now connects the arts and healthcare because we are probably the only theater company that actually does this on a regular basis because I've also set up a, a creative therapy, you know, what do you call it? A creative therapy studio at a government hospital in Chennai. And this is the first of its kind in India, probably in Asia, but definitely in India, where we get arts therapists to come in and do workshops with children who are, it's a children's government hospital. So it's with children who are, in hospital for very long lengths of time. And what happens when children or anybody for that matter who is seriously ill, they are living in a hospital, you know, sterile kind of an environment for a very long time. It affects mm -hmm. their mind. It affects their well-being. It affects how good they feel about or how bad they feel about themselves. And I feel the arts is absolutely wonderful in helping them to feel, you know, to get out of that uh, prison kind of a feeling, uh, to connect with things which are more positive, which will actually help them feel happier. And that's what we are trying to do. And I realize that these children walk into the studio, they're really impressed and thrilled to see the studio because I've made it a world-class space. It's air conditioned with wooden floors, a wall full of mirrors. And, you know, these are children who come from very, very poor backgrounds and even their own schools wouldn't have such facilities. And I don't cut corners at all for anything. And I get re uh, professionally uh, trained therapists to come in to do the workshops and the children love it. And they are constantly asking, when is the next workshop? So yes. This, I know it helps. This is such a, you know, in need. Um, and that's why right now, you know, actually people listening to us all over the globe. And, uh, you know, we use a lot of devices in our days. And uh, why your experience I feel so important because there is nothing can replace this human connection and the interaction and actually, you know, play things that, you know, in real life. I work in the hospital and I see things every day. So we know how long, you know, people stay in the hospital. A lot of times it's just, you know, one room and it's so much isolation. And it's especially right now with all pandemic, you know, it really becoming so difficult on people, mental health, emotions, even the strongest people, it's really, really takes big toll. So I feel like what you are doing applicable in any country, because this is something that, you know, I can stand up right now and go pretty much act, right? Well, I can't act, of course, but sort of help and use some tools. So can you give us maybe a couple of examples, um, what tools you are using and maybe what theme of the play or what motivates patients the most? So uh, we have done different kinds of workshops. We have done dance workshops where my choreographer has come in and done, you know, workshops with the children because I think it's, 
even though they may be cancer patients or children suffering from very rare blood diseases, you know, mm -hmm. disorders, um, within their energy levels and within their scope of activity, they are able to uh, do certain, and children are children. They want to run about and jump about and, you know, given an opportunity. So they are really happy to be part of a dance workshop. Or, or we have had artists come in and I have these um, glass whiteboards on the wall in the corridor leading uh -huh. into the studio. And so they've done wall paintings over there. On the wall, okay, okay. On the board. Uh -huh. So it's glass walls, which I have made boards. And uh -huh. so they have been uh, encouraged to do paintings on that. And they have come up with some beautiful paintings. Yeah. Uh, you know, so, sorry. What, what are you? What are they using? Are they using like a? Paint, is it a chalk or paint? Paint, paint, brush. paint. paint. Okay. So it's kind of there, like a permanent display. Now we haven't removed it. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, interrupting you. Yes, you know, like we were taught not to paint on the walls, so that's yeah. why <laughs> what you created is just so appealing because every child would want to paint on the wall. <laughs> exactly. Well, we have given them whiteboards with glass on the outside, and Sengoben actually sponsored all that for me, and they sponsored all the mirrors. So I have a lot of corporates who came in to help me set up the whole studio. So mm -hmm. uh, when I started the project, I thought, oh gosh, it's going to cost me a whole lot of money. I didn't even have one rupee in the bank towards the project. But miraculously, all these corporates step stepped in and you know, help me set up the whole place, which is really fantastic. So okay. that that is that is what makes it happen. So we we then I get in a lot of art material. They've done collages, and uh, mm -hmm. another time they did. Um, you know, you get these brown papers, and then you cut out the uh, the the silhouette of the child, yes. and then they draw themselves in. So. For a trained therapist, they can make out from the colors that they are using and the expressions they're putting on the face of the silhouette of themselves, you know, how the child is feeling. So the art therapy and you know, play therapy, all these therapies are amazing if it is done by a professional therapist because they'll be able to give you feedback on what the child is also feeling. Mm -hmm. It helps them explain you know, express themselves of their innermost thoughts. You know, they're feeling lonely, they're feeling scared, mm -hmm. or they're feeling depressed or whatever. So one can actually then take it to the next level and help them. You can bring in other therapy, mm -hmm. therapeutic tools to help them cope with what they're feeling. Yeah. So it's not just random design. It's a very well thought process. Yeah, that's yeah. very interesting. And um, I would like to ask you, um, Aisha, from all of it, and, you know, you started speaking in the beginning, you know, it's been decades, you know, you've done so much valuable work, but can you give us like one example? What was the hardest moment in your life or maybe more vulnerable or maybe more memorable that it's kind of, well, I wish I would do that. See, my <laughs> wish for the last um, nearly 27 years is to set up a, a performing arts center, which is right in the middle of the city of Chennai. We don't have a proper space of that kind. I mean, the government keeps building all these uh, shopping malls and you know yeah. parking spaces, and I'm sure we need them. But I do feel very strongly that we need to have a centrally located space where you have multiple theater spaces for experimental theater, a space for them to watch a bigger production, maybe a black box where you can do smaller productions, mm -hmm. uh, a cafe uh, where you can have maybe supper theaters or tea theaters. I don't know, it needs to be yeah. with a library where you can go in and get books. So that is my vision and my dream, which still hasn't happened. Yeah. About 20 years ago, they gave me land which was outside the city. Mm -hmm. And I actually said, it's not going to work. And I gave it back. And they couldn't believe that I gave up two acres of land. I said, yeah, yeah but I'm not trying to build a house for myself. I want it to be something which is not a white elephant. 
Mm -hmm. uh, because I may build it and, you know, they'll remember that I built it. But if it's not going to serve the purpose I wanted to do, there's no point in doing that. It's yeah. a waste of effort, time and money. It yeah. has to be functional. So why is it like personally for you, what drives you personally, like you, Aisha, to do that? What's your own sort My, of, where, where oh. it's coming from, you, your <laughs> personal story? I, mean, yeah. I think it's just that um, I've come from a background where I have never had to want for anything. Okay. I have, you know, I have wealthy parents and they always provided me with everything. I have a husband who provided me with all kinds of other things and I could also work and earn enough money. I live in a nice house. I have, I've never wanted for anything and I've always wanted, I think I get the most amount of happiness when I'm able to help someone. I think that is basically my nature and I love to work with children and I want to make every child on planet earth happy because they never asked to be born. They, you know, and it, and I think where you are born and to who you are born is like a Russian roulette. You know, you end up in that particular space. Yeah. I could have been born to parents who lived in the slum, for instance, and I visit the slums quite often because we have educated children from the slums over the last 25 years, a whole number of them. And they are very beautiful children. And, and it was not... So even when they come to visit me in my office, you know, they'll be standing. That is the difference between a child who has, who comes from a, a underprivileged background versus a privileged child. A privileged child will walk into your office and sit down. An underprivileged child has no confidence. They will come into your room and stand until you ask them to sit down. And I, and I always say, I'm not going to ask you to sit down because you have every right to sit down. So they have learned because from that itself, they have learned a lesson from me that they have a right to sit down. They don't have to ask to be able to sit down. You know, yeah. so I feel I want to be able to make every child feel that way and provide for them. I mean, I can just do what I can for small numbers of children. But as they say, every drop, you know, mm -hmm. uh, ma matters. And it's it's many, many millions of drops that make an ocean, right? So yes, hopefully. Yeah. And the word that was born in you, you're, you know, person with a big heart. And right now, person of a big influence. And yes, some of us, you know, born in a certain situation, you know, I grew up in a very simple condition. Yes, I didn't starve for food, but we pl basically plant and harvest our own food. <laughs> and that's how we live. You know, I grew up initially, we had black and white TV, with three channels. And now I carry pretty much a phone in the palm of my hand or TV in the palm of my hand. And uh, where it's coming from, What? Did, how it was born, what are the roots that, you know, what you are doing? And I really love how you said, Every child has a right because, yes, some children, they walk in the room and they would not sit down. And then the other person, you know, just would you please slow down? Just, you know, how right now, right now I can't even walk on the street. A lot of times, you know, children just cutting in front of your car or cutting in front of you. And you think like, wh where is this? How do we make people, you know, polite? I feel like we go from one extreme to another. Where are the roots for this? Be help children. Uh, help children. Yeah, I think it it matters a lot uh, in the parenting styles mm. because children learn from from example. You know, you may say something to a child, but if you are doing exactly the opposite, they are learning it, and and they start. In fact, they say by the time they are two years old. Children have already learned to be bullies because they have watched yes. one parent bully because yeah. they have watched one parent who is bullying the other parent. Mm -hmm. They say, huh, this is how it works. All right. So 
So imagine from zero to two years is when they are soaking in all that is happening around them so that mm. by the time they are two years old, they know how it is to get their way by bullying. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. It is really important when, when one has a child, how you behave between mm -hmm. the parents, how you talk to your child and how you talk to other people. Mm -hmm. They see you being very disrespectful to each other or to other people. They're going to pick that up. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. Yeah, this is this so much valuable advices because you know the reason you and I we come from you know completely different parts of the world, and right now we're speaking on common conversation. And I think this is applies to our neighborhood, our city, not only our country; it's global. So, Aisha, with that, I would like to ask you: Can you please give us three tips or three advices that you would like to? I know you already gave a lot, and I feel like I'm asking already too much from you. But can you just summarize maybe three things for our audience? Have children if you really want to have a child. Okay, and when you have a child. Bring them up through the arts. My children grew up learning music, dance, and you know, theater and a sport. Both my children represent the country in sailing. You know, so they are all these things help children to become well-rounded people and be kind. You need to be kind to yourself first and to one another because it's only kindness that is going to pave the way forward because we need to get rid of hate. Hate is what makes everybody look at each other and, you know, not trust mm -hmm. one another. Yeah. I covered two things. <laughs> yes. No, thank you. This, this is so valuable and things that you told us and share experience is just so close and not, not only to my heart, but a lot of people because cover, you know, about children and education. And, uh, you know, you are a person, you didn't have to do what you are doing. And, uh, you know, could just sort of, you know, like a lot of people, you know, use the resources. And uh, sometimes we abuse the resources. And you just went and you tried to start from the roots and help children. And, you uh, Given a prime example, like your daughter, and it's just uh, so, so valuable. So we would love to connect with you. And thank you so much, Aisha, for joining us. It's been a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you so much. And I would love for you to stay just, uh, if you can, for a few more minutes. We're going to no. meet John. And if you can't, I understand. I know it's a midnight. And um, no, I have no problem. To thank you. So thank you. And I will see you soon. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And with that, I would like to invite our special guest, uh, John. John. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. I know we all come in from a different continents, not only from different countries, and I'm so grateful. So welcome, John, please tell us your full name, where are you located, and a little bit of your backstory. Okay, I'm John Wargeith, and I'm based in London, UK. Um, I've been living here for more than... 40 years. I came from South India, Kerala, and I've been living here since the 1980s. So quite a long time. Um, yeah, I'm a, a lot of things changed. <laughs> yes, definitely. A lot of things have changed. Um, I'm a um, passionate video and filmmaker, and I do a lot of... Um, things to do with uh, online and media-based projects. So that's the main things. This is a very much a connection because today we are discussing on mindset health and uh, like with Aisha and you, uh, there is a special connection. It's not coincidence why I wanted for 
both of you being my guest because I feel like we are related in some creative art and we're really discussing how that creative art actually influence our wellness. You know, a lot of times what we do, we spend so much time working and doing other things that, you know, ultimately we have to decide, you know, is it our passion? Am I happy? Because if I'm not happy at work, then all of this unhappiness I'm going to bring home. <laughs> and yes. um, can you tell us a little bit well, where um, your roots started and how your personal story related to what you are doing? Why did you decide to do what you are doing? Okay, so the story is actually pretty um, uh, interesting. Um, I started all the way back when I was 15. I was actually invited to film the end of year uh, music concert for one of my friends. And um, he asked me to uh, do the video because um, I had a small interest in it and his father was a photographer. And so I did it and I remember standing on the stage with him, filming him. Oh, um, and I remember looking um, from the camera to the audience. And although that was quite scary, I actually found it exciting. And I remember thinking to myself, this is the best job in the world. Um, it was difficult, but um, interesting. And I remember going around um, the um, singer and, you know, the same um, hysteria, the same jubilation that he had, I had mm -hmm. from a different perspective. And I really enjoyed it. And I remember I had said to myself, I wasn't even thinking of a career in media or, or video. And I said, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And it started from there. And then I went into uh, working in the medical field. So I was actually working as a cameraman to do training videos for doctors. And really? one of my tasks, yes. So oh. one of my tasks was to film operations. Now, if you actually- You are? Yes. It's so, the operations room? Yes, yes. Oh, wow. That's, yes. yes, please, please go on. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just can't hold no, my emotion. No, no. Yes. No, so I actually um, was given that opportunity because I had quite a lot of skills in camera work and video. And I remember when I was asked, I was actually thinking, I don't know whether I can really do this, but I remember being um, put into a um, operating theatre and sitting there with the camera um, looking at um, a patient who was being operated on. And I've seen quite a lot of things, but if you know me, um, I actually don't like the sight of blood. I was going to say, like, yes, looking at the blood and, you know, yes, I am a physician, but still, it's, yes, so tell me. Yes, so I remember what I used to do was in my mind, I used to look through the viewfinder and say, that's not real, um, even though I can see it's real. And it doesn't kind of affect me because I'm not the one being operated on. So it was really interesting. And as a result of that, I managed to get a job um, doing um, editing for a surgeon at the Royal College of Surgeons in London. And I used to do training videos for the surgeons mm. um, and operating and doing the workshops and things like that that they do. So that was really exciting, interesting. And I remember there was a really good story and I'll tell you this, it's very short. I remember... Yeah. I, I was editing this video for the surgeon and 
I made this very silly comment to this um, world-renowned top surgeon. Uh, <laughs> surgeon, yes. And I wonder I just, how they react. <laughs> yes, uh, now that's the interesting thing because <laughs> I just said to him, oh, this looks interesting. Um, interesting, he said to me, do you know if I go one millimeter to the left, that that patient will be paralyzed for the rest of their life. Then one millimeter to the right, they would probably die. Mm -hmm. And I said, wow, you know, because this was inside the brain that he was doing the neurosurgery. And, you know, he was making some sort of incision and things like that. And, you know, the good thing is, I don't need to know any of these things. I just need to know when to do the cut and when to finish the shot. And so, you know, then I would add the titles and do the voiceover and stuff like that. And so, you know, it was really interesting to see that because you then realize that you have to be on the top of your game but also working with true medical professionals, you know, allowed me to work under a lot of stress, but a lot of um, creative projects. And that was really a big, um, I think, a big bonus for me and it helped me to grow um, with a lot more confidence. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it also has to do a lot with the uh, mindset because how you mentioned, you know, in the beginning you see blood and you think, no, it's not real. And then you also go through so much stress and because you have so much passion, you actually can overcome a lot of things. Yes. And uh, you brought a very valid point because although we love what we do, you know, we become so passionate but also, you know, sometimes that passion can really, like you said, overwork and overstress. And, um, you know, I love seeing patients every day. And also a lot of physicians, you know, feel sort of, well, in healthcare professionals and other fields, all fields, you know, we go after passion or we open a new business or, you know, any pro big project and we so much dive in in our passion, then we you know, sort of family on the side or other things get involved. And finally, what we do, we burn out. So yes. how did you actually carry so many years with all stress, how we can turn and show that it's possible to be passionate and not burn out? Okay. Um, so something interesting happened. I actually after the Royal College of Surgeons had worked for a production company. We used to travel around the world. I had filmed um, sort of um, award shows. So, you know, I've seen and filmed some of the top uh, celebrities in the late 1990s. And one of the biggest honors for me was doing a, um, introduction video when Princess Diana passed away and um, the news had come out and they wanted to um, highlight Candle in the Wind, which was a song that Elton John had written on behalf of uh, Princess Diana. And I remember I was editing that video and that even though it was stressful, you know, I knew that that was a moment in time of history that it would um, be marked. And that has so much memories for me. But after that, um, I actually started working in a school and um, working as a media and video technician. I used to do training videos for the school, um, small uh, projects and helping youngsters to do the, uh, uh, in UK we have uh, 16 to 17 year olds who do the uh, A-levels. 
And for them, they have to do one project, which is a magazine cover and uh, contents, and also a short video. And sometimes it's a music video, sometimes it's a trailer. So I've been working there for the last 18 years, and it's a completely different ball game, but I find it um, not that difficult because, you know, I've actually gone through a lot more stress and the teachers and the students are quite impressed how I don't get um, stressed out or overcome with um, the technical issues that come when you are working on last minute projects. And yeah. so, you know, this um, experience that I had gained over many years, I was able to apply it. And for me, the one thing I realized, and in the last two years, I'm trying to set up an online business to do video editing projects for other professionals, probably like yourself, you know, to do training videos. Yeah. And I don't know if I qualify after you did Princess Diane, but uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I really enjoy it. And what I've realized is if you follow your passion, your interests, then, although I shouldn't say it, money doesn't matter, mm -hmm. it really means that you do it for the love of it and you're not chasing it for the money. And that's a really important mindset um, um, framing to have. Mm -hmm. And that's held me in good stead all these years. So I always tell the youngsters, even my daughter, um, mm -hmm. and even though I've gone... Right now. <laughs> Sorry? I said, I hope your daughter is listening right now. I hope so too. Um, <laughs> you know... It's interesting because I wanted my daughter to go into media and video. I have taken her to uh, other projects, working with Canon UK and other big companies. And she's chosen to do IT and computing. And mm -hmm. I said, do whatever you feel like, but make sure you try different things because you might not know which one you do like which one you might not like. So that's probably the best advice that I give to the students, you know, do the best at um, whatever you can. And, you know, if you find it difficult, try something else. And, you know, you will find eventually something that you really enjoy. And even though maybe it's difficult, you will push through that pain in order to get to the other side. Yeah, and I think, uh, John, you brought a very important point, how, you know, the influence, it's not only teaching point for children, but also teaching mm -hmm. point for parents and all leaders and mentors and chair department, everyone, because uh, we have to understand, you know, what the person wants. And, you mm -hmm. know, there have been probably about, I don't know how many years ago, but I still hear today that, you know, some people, they do, they try to, you know, please parents or, you know, complete certain degree because for the spouse and it's so much pressure from the family that we, you know, someone realized, I just heard the other day, you know, doing PhD, is it really doing PhD for that person or doing PhD for somebody else? And, um, you know, this this is not person that I interview on my show, but it's just someone that brought my attention and doing, you know, any sort of work or occupation or anything, you know, you really have to focus on that passion. But what if you are distracted by others or mm -hmm. you have so much pressure from others? You know, you are a wise person and you speak with daughter and I hope your daughter listening to us. And I just want to tell a message to her. Your dad is amazing. And uh, <laughs> thank you for sharing. But additional, can you give us maybe some additional advice? You know, how do you actually navigate? How do you bring it back from what you want to the right route? Okay. So um, even though my journey sounds like it was 
um, um, easy um, I've had to experience in the last five years, divorce, separation. And, you know, it's difficult because this is the number one thing that is not talked about, you know, and especially for men, they have an ego, they um, don't like to cry, especially in front of others and things. Mm -hmm. And this has been difficult for me, but it's taken me a good year and a half to come to terms with it. And I'm actually at the moment working with an organization called Restored Lives in the UK, and it's a charity. And we help um, people who are going through divorce, separation, and we give them, it's like the marriage course, but it's to help the people who might have bitterness, who might have resentment, and make them think both sides of the story. And for whatever reason, th that one person might have decided to leave the relationship, you know, but to still co-parent. And Restored Lives, I've been editing all of their videos, and we have eight videos, and we do a weekly um, online Zoom similar to this, and mm -hmm. we show the videos, and then we give the opportunity at different intervals to talk to the participants. And what's really phenomenal about this, since we started, we had about 25 people on Zoom. Now it's gone to maybe about 120 people on Zoom at the same time mm -hmm. around the country. And that couldn't have been done before. And this is when we realized, you know, parents, some parents mm -hmm. will find it difficult to come to central London to do the course. And mm -hmm. this online Zoom, the online route allowed us to um, deliver this course and the number one thing that we had from a lot of the participants was even though it's difficult, you know, this gave us a framework and talked about letting go, forgiveness, setting boundaries, you know, things which really should have been taught at um, the beginning of the marriage, but sometimes doesn't get taught. But that's sort of helped me to get over some of the stress and problems because I'm sort of helping on that course. Yeah, yeah, this is very valuable work. Thank you for sharing because now a lot of people listen to you globally and uh, probably thinking, okay, how can I help the community and how can I unite? So what you are doing is very important, especially, you know, hearing from uh, men's standpoint, because a lot of women organizations been organized and it's a big draw. So not mm. stories of the man and how we can support each other and basically unite without drawing, you know, one angle to another. You know, we all parents, we all, you know, want the best. So this is very, very important. Yes, John, thank you. You um, told us so many valuable advices and story. Can you please give us three tips? And I know you already did, but kind of mm. summarize for our audience, please. Okay. Um, I think one of the best thing somebody had taught me was follow your passion, whatever is your interest and that you like to do, even when others aren't looking, that tends to be maybe part of your passion. And so do that. The second thing is forgiveness. Forgiveness is such a big topic, but there's three types of forgiveness, which is what I've learned. You know, there's forgiving the other person if mm -hmm. there was an issue, but then also to go with that is you forgiving yourself. And those who are religious, you know, maybe it's forgiving yourself or your maker. So whoever that is, you know, as a Christian, we believe in God. And so 
that is really important, that three different types. And for me, it was first the forgiveness of the other person. And then I thought it was all over. And then the forgiveness of myself because I was um, holding back resentment and things. Mm -hmm. And then the last thing is, you know, take a day at a time. Things can get overwhelming, but remember that tomorrow is another day and you'll be fine. So just take that advice. Thank you. Thank you. You brought such a deep conversation that now I don't know how to transition to our panel. Thank you so much, John. Okay. And uh, thank you so much for being with us and share so much story and information and everything. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. And with that, if you please stay with us just for a few minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would like to bring Aisha and we'll have a little uh, panel and discussion. Thank you, John. I will see you right back. I'm Dr. Okay. Ludmila Schaefer, and I level the playing field of knowledge around disease prevention, research, and patient care to help you to make informed decisions. All right, we are back. We are back. What an overwhelming, overwhelming conversation. And uh, it, it, even I work in medicine, and we have deep conversations every single day. Like right now, I have a goosebumps because things hearing from both of you is just really so close to my heart. And um, Aisha, John, thank you so much for joining the kindness and forgiveness and how we sort of put together mindset and wellness and health and theater and media. I mean, we can just get overwhelmed. So... Thank you for being with us. And I also would like now to see if we can, you know, open some panel on discussion. Maybe you have questions for each other. I'm just going to pause for a minute and uh, you're welcome to ask each other a question if you like. Yeah, Aisha, I just wanted to ask you, is there um, some sort of um, thing that you do with your patients or the people that you work with to help them when they go through stressful situations? What do you recommend? Since we're working in a hospital, mm -hmm. I think they have the psychiatric ward there, so they have psychiatrists there to help children, you know, if they are going through. We can only be you know, of service in telling the doctors that this child is, you know, feeling terrible or whatever. I mean, obviously they're all feeling terrible, but uh, we can that. So we we don't have any other program as such. No. So you do sort of creative projects with the children in order to try and help yeah. them come out. Exactly. Because essentially we are a theater company. We do production. So we have children who are wealthy, who pay for their workshops. They're part of a big production in December every year. So for 25 years, we have done that. Last year was the first time it had to cancel, and we are canceling again this December. So that's my fundraiser. The corporates come in and sponsor the show. And that brings them the money to you know, pay for the education, scholarships, for the... Uh, hospital clown visits to the hospital. So all those, it, it's kind of a well-oiled system. So and basically we do the workshops and creatives and we have professional actors within our group. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, it's something that we can probably repurpose because one thing's drawing. I even see, you know, patients, they like, or even my friends, you know, you take and you draw in and use different colors. So that's one. Second, a lot of people, they also don't know skills, maybe chat something and uh, give a freelance discussion. You know, 
just think wild. What do you like to do? Like, for example, I never thought I'll be here. <laughs> I couldn't sure. even dream about it. So I can't even tell my dream because I never thought I will be here. So sometimes we uncover, you know, new possibilities. And I think since pandemic became and, you know, everybody closed and, you know, with mental health and hospitals, everybody on lockdown and so constrained, probably possibility, you know, open something new. So I was thinking maybe John thinks like drawing or sometimes people offer, you know, maybe share recipes for cooking or maybe mm. some can play for, you know, certain theater. I've seen people who never acted and they come on a stage and it's like, wow, factor. <laughs> so yes. maybe that's one of them. Um, I don't know if that's something possible. Yeah. Um one of the things that I found that I was doing when I was going through the stress and challenges was um, I would go out to the garden to take some pictures. And if you look at my Instagram, I've got lots of photos of flowers, nature, beauty. And, you know, it just gave me a lot of peace, um, a lot of... Um, um, moment to reflect about things. And I think these are tools that we can share with youngsters. Obviously, you know, you have to control the use of social media and the mobile phone. And that goes without saying, but the youngsters these days are so dependent on it. It is like a drug and I think we as parents, we have to police that and ensure that that is not overtaking their focus, their education and things. And one of the biggest challenges we face here in UK schools is simply the overuse um, of social media um, in middle of the night. Um, and yeah. Yes, and it's become so much n normal now to give a young two or three year old a mobile phone to calm them down. But mm -hmm. gone are the days of giving them some paper or something to draw in color. It helps um, with the creative skills, you know. Um, and, you know, shockingly and <laughs> Maybe I shouldn't reveal this, but in some of the schools, uh, secondary schools, we have students who come from primary, 11 years old, who um, we were quite shocked that they couldn't even read a book. And um, mm -hmm. it's something that even the primary school um, must have seen and realized, but they didn't tackle. So we have to now, part of the curriculum in secondary schools is ensure that the baseline of reading and writing is brought up to a higher standard than what it was. And, you know, I would say that that mobile phone has had a lot to do with it as a result of it being introduced and, you know, the lower cost and so forth. Yeah, yes. yeah. And I, I was just going to add to that. Um, I have a granddaughter now. She's only about 11 months old. And mm. there are two. <laughs> and I have... Uh, I, and I'm an author. I write books for children. So I've published quite a few books. And so my interest is that all, all kids should read, obviously. So, um, and I'm also very interested in puppetry and so on. So for this little baby, from when she was one month old, I started with the black and white book so that she could see that you know, they don't see color till a few months on. But even at 11 months, she reads her books because she loves her books. We read to her. And, you know, and then I spent one whole month creating a puppet theater for her, which I made from cardboard and fabric. And I have, I, I have made the 
special puppet, but then I sourced all the animals from online because I thought, okay, it's going to take me forever to create all these. And I'm thinking up uh, puppet uh, shows for her. And my son-in-law is actually a pretty well-known film actor now, but he's he's the artistic director of my theater company. So he is really good at uh, the entertainment. I like to just do the groundwork and create these things. And I'm a, a shy performer. So I get him to do the performance, which is good. It's his, his daughter anyway. So it's, so I think if one can create the interest when they are babies, that is hmm. the only way it will take it forward for when they're old. They can't suddenly start wanting to read. You know? yeah. My, they, it has to be, it is a learned thing. It has to be taught. And, and, and age zero to five is when they are really wanting to know a lot of things. So if you do not teach them all these things in that age range they're not going to be interested yeah you know, they just yeah. move on to whatever they want to so for me now because i used to do toddler theater from 2010 onwards that's from for i've been working with the two to four year olds but because of my granddaughter i have started theater for the zero to two year olds and i her best friend who is one month older than her so from when she was six months old is i've been doing workshops so i have created workshops for these babies and and it's amazing how they respond and they are i, I, they, I can keep them engaged for half an hour these are babies mm. but mm. it's amazing that they if you are bothered to work with the child of the baby they will yeah. respond. They are interested. They will want to learn. So yeah. it's really the onus is on you. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I, I think what I learned from both of you that get distracted children early. It's either hmm. you know, away from the phone. We got to find either take them in a green environment or show puppy or read them books, you know, sort of maybe find a different solution rather than hmm. Like John, you said, yes, they sit with the phone right now. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, well, before pandemic, you would go eat and you would see that, you know, children sitting with the phone. But I think that also brings important point, not only for people who do or do not have a phone, but also for communities who don't have access to the phone. And for those mm -hmm. who don't, um, both of you brought such a valuable things like kindness and forgiveness and passion and strength. And um, it's what you have resources. You know, it can be just environment. It can be play. It can be, you know, some other thing that children find. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you, both of you. And um, I just would like to ask if you have any last sort of 30 seconds wisdom to our audience and we are almost at the top of the hour. I feel like I could be here with you and I know it's a midnight and it's late. I shouldn't use opportunity to be in a shiny day here. So I'm very, very grateful. But can you just recap in 30 seconds, the last word for the audience? Yeah, for me, I would say is if you're feeling quite low, um, upset, maybe go out to nature, go for a walk, take time away from the situation. And that will probably help, even if it's to the seaside or beach, somewhere away from your usual surroundings. That would be my advice. Thank you. Thank you. Aisha. Okay, I was just thinking, um, I think what you need, which would be really good for every child is to develop their imagination. Okay, hmm. So if you can develop their imagination using different artistic tools, you know, if you can help them, because if they're, if you have imagination, you can escape from whatever situation you're in, you can find solutions to problems if you are thrown in the middle of a, you know, whatever. So if you can develop that imagination of your child, I think you'll be doing that child a big favor. And you need the arts for that. Thank you. That's where the, yes, uh, imagination, develop imagination and those tools also lead later in life being um, healthy, maintain your wellness, 
and mental health. So thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Aisha and John. Thank you so much. Enjoy having you. And with that, unfortunately, we are at the top of the hour. And thank you so much for joining us. And I will see you in a minute, just in the backstage. I will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. With that, I would like to tell everyone, thank you very much for being with us on the Dr. Connect show. Join and subscribe our YouTube channel and comment. And also we would love for you to be our guest. We are super excited to have you on this journey with us. And thank you for watching and listening. And we are looking forward to seeing you in the next one. And bye-bye for now. I'm Dr. Lizinla Schaefer, and I level the playing field of knowledge around wellness, medicine, and research to help you to make informed decisions.